Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us for Digital Twins in Oil and Gas. My name is Nicole Bamford, and I am the moderator for today's session. On behalf of Leslie, Angeliki, Quinn, and I, we thank you for joining us over the next two days. This panel presentation, Capturing the Value of Digital Twins, How to Jumpstart Your Digital Twin Journey and Drive ROI Fast, will be given by Ken Nguyen, Digital Program Manager BP, David Hartle, EVP Development Operations and Production of New Age African Global Energy, Chris White, Global Director Operations and Engineering Excellence from ConocoPhillips, and our panel moderator will be Sadir Nelvalgo, Vice President Engineering OWL Cyber Defense. It's their presentation promises to be well worth a listen. Before we get started, here are some quick administrative points. During the webinar, if you have questions for the presenters about anything raised during their webinar, please submit them in the Q&A box on your screen. And these will be answered as we go or during the question session after the presentation. Likewise, for any technical questions, please write them in the Q&A section and we'll get to them right away. The widgets on your screen can be resized and dragged around. We encourage you to visit the resource center on your screen for additional content and resources we and our sponsors have provided for you. So make sure you're sitting comfortably and now I'll hand it over to Sadir so we can begin. Thank you, Nicole, and good morning and good afternoon, good evening to, where, uh, to all the audience participants wherever you are. And welcome to this keynote panel discussion on capturing the value of digital twins in oil and gas. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel of industry experts uh, who can share their knowledge in deploying, building and deploying digital twins. I myself, as Nicole mentioned, work for OWL Cyber Defense, which is a supplier of uh, cross-domain and data diode cybersecurity technologies. And we provide a combination of filtering and content inspection software backed by hardware and source data flows that restrict data flow and highly regulate access to digital and operational assets, which become key as you deploy digital twins. And we have uh, our products deployed in the critical infrastructure markets, such as oil and gas, uh, the utility sector, finance, telecom, and importantly, aerospace, government, military, and intelligence sectors as well. And I'm very pleased to be presenting this, as I mentioned, uh, as I have a deep interest in, in the creation and deployment of digital twins. Now, coming to the topic of the discussion itself, the, the term digital twin has been around for a while. Uh, but it's only in the last five or six years that we've seen this take on a bigger role in the digital transformation of many industrial companies. And I remember reading a Gartner report in 2017 where they, they mentioned that digital twins were on their hype cycle of top emerging technology trends. And, um, and, and they followed that report up in 2018 uh, by saying that digital twins were at the peak of uh, inflated expectations. And normally for anyone that follows Gartner's hype cycle of emerging trends, uh, you can see that they paint a picture of technology trends that go through a phase of rising and inflated expectations, and then you have a, uh, it's followed by a trough of disillusionment before it really starts on the climb on a slope of enlightenment, followed by a steady state of uh, on a plateau of productivity. Now, that said, I would say we may be at an inflection point where we are at between the trough of disillusionment and the slope of enlightenment and productivity with digital trends. So to discuss all of this today, uh, so we have a very experienced group of uh, panelists to tell us uh, how digital trends provide value in oil and gas specifically and share their insights on their journey with, with digital trends. So with that, what we'll do is the panelists and I will have a discussion for about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll leave the, the last 15 minutes or so for the audience to ask any questions of the panelists. All right, so, so gentlemen, uh, you ready to begin? All right, sure. um, so, so let me start with uh, Chris, uh, this question uh, on the fundamentals of digital trends. So I know different industry practitioners deploy different definitions for digital twins. So how would you describe what a digital twin is, Chris? Yeah, certainly. So for me, there are 
two important considerations for digital twin. And the first is uh, access to information and doing that in what I call one-stop shopping through a visual information hub. So it's essentially a visual representation of the facility, but, but having access to all or most pertinent data to be able to operate, modify uh, that data, as, uh, that asset. Then the second comes down to uh, simulation and you know, simulation has been around our industry for, for decades. Uh, but to me, digital twins is more than just simulation. Simulation traditionally has been, you know, run off, have a model, a separate model, come back, make some decisions in a few weeks time, uh, and then make some adjustments to your operation. Digital twins really means uh, at or near real time conditions, being able to simulate and make decisions. So both for process as well as making decisions uh, on the fly for modification projects. So having that information at your fingertips uh, for for that near, near time uh, uh, decision making. Thanks, Casey. And David, do you, do you have a different opinion? Do you have a different not, definition of digital twins or you agree did, with what Chris mentioned? Uh, Digital twins are one of those kind of things you probably ask 10 people, you get 10 different, subtly different kind of descriptions, but usually people are talking about different aspects of it. What I uh, like that Chris mentioned is um, a digital twin is a virtual representation of an asset. And we, we, we can use this uh, from the very start of uh, engineering and design um, through building and operation and maintain it and keep it accessible all throughout the life cycle. So it's a powerful tool, it has many manif manifestations that different people will talk about, but it's that virtual representation of, uh, of an asset. Yeah, thanks, uh, David. And, uh, how about you, Ken? I, I suspect your interpretation will be no different from the other panelists, but I want to get your take on that and how you deployed them. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of uh, my views are similar to David and Chris. Um, I, I think the my view of the digital twin, it, it has to be a complete um, digital replica uh, of the entire asset, whether that's uh, the reservoir to the subsea to the, the top side. It should be a singular digital twin that represents that entire thing that allows, I think, as, as um, um, Chris mentioned, you know, a single point uh, where you can have entry into this data. One of the things that we see is that in this day of information age, that there's an abundant amount of information that's kind of floating everywhere. And the key is how to make sense of that data in the, the time needed to make that decision, right? So, um, so it's important to be able, from the digital twin, a way to aggregate the data such that it presents the data, whether it's static or dynamic data, in a way that you can make uh, decisions, whether that's uh, about a design, whether it's about an operational issue, whether it's about uh, other types of um, scenarios. So I think the ability for the digital twin and where that's going, uh, I think it's a could be a revolutionary step to the way that we build uh, and uh, operate a facility and a field. Okay. And, and so, Ken, so where are you uh, in your journey with digital twins? Meaning, are you uh, are, are you just starting out on your digital journey and with, with digital twins, or are you a, a more advanced practitioner? How would you describe your journey? Well, broadly across you know, my company, BP, you know, there's various stages of, of where we're at, as with most companies, right? So, I, uh, but especially on the area that I'm working on, which is one of the major projects in the Gulf of Mexico, where we're building a greenfield project with a new facility and uh, new uh, subsea equipment uh, and, and a, a reservoir with, uh, with oil and gas. We're actually pretty mature in, in where we're at uh, relative to um, you know where the concept of the digital twin is. So we're, we're at a stage where we have a, a fully built replica of the reservoir of the seabed and of the top side. And we've incorporated both um, static data, of course, where all the supplier data and the documents and, and data sheets and, and commissioning data, as well as 
uh, live data, whether that's marine data with uh, wave and weather and loop currents in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and, and when the process incorporating uh, operational data as well from our reservoir and our uh, production management system. So I would say, you know, at least on this uh, area that I'm working on, we're, we're fairly uh, advanced uh, in, in what we've been able to deliver so far. Okay. And how about you, Chris? I mean, where are you and uh, where's your company in your journey with digital plans? I, I would say that uh, we're not quite as far as long as, as BP, and we're still kind of at the relative infancy of the adoption of digital twins within the company. Uh, but we do see the value, and, and we're focused right now on, on acceleration of this technology throughout the company. Uh, we do have some pockets, though, of, you know, more, that are more mature than others. Uh, Norway is a good example in the, in the North Sea, uh, where we have uh, developed, just finished uh, putting together a visualization twin that's uh, also an information hub, uh, and utilizing that for work planning as well as for inspection workflows. And, and the aim really is to, to you know, have, have fewer people offshore and make the process more efficient. We've also been uh, integrating uh, simulation twins in with some of our LNG operations as well for uh, near-time or real-time uh, decision-making, as I mentioned earlier. And then another application in the, in the unconventionals in, in Permian, which, which folks uh, don't often equate digital twin with, is uh, the networks, uh, whether it's uh, gathering systems, uh, power systems. So we've been delving into in the Permian with power systems and developing a twin of our power network for planning uh, and optimization purposes. So it's kind of, kind of a mixed bag, but I, I would say we're still uh, really in the early stages of implementing digital twin and still learning as we're going along. Okay, and we'll, I'll probably come back to you with some of the questions on how your journey has been coming out. So let me move on to uh, David. So David, where are you in your journey with Digital Twins? Um, a lot of companies uh, have the elements of Digital Twin, and maybe they don't even use the term Digital Twin. Uh, most companies have uh, process simulations for uh, – um, doing designing the the, the process facilities. Uh, most companies have done something with their control systems. Uh, most companies have 3D CAD simulations of uh, of their facility that they use to help design and build it. And most companies have structural analyses type packages. Digital twins are a a, a way of trying to combine all that into. Uh, uh, sort of a single sort of platform so that you can go in, for example, into uh, uh, a 3D CAD simulation and click on an element and there would be all the contextual data for it. So um, I, I would imagine that, that many of the companies that are listening in, to this might think that they're not very far along on Digital Twin, but actually they have a lot of the building blocks. And that's what I see uh, in a lot of the small and medium companies is people have the, the building blocks. Maybe they haven't yet called it Digital Twin, but they're sort of on the journey to that. And uh, uh, webinars like this help encourage people to stay on that journey and get everything linked up, as uh, Ken mentioned, from subsurface to the, the, sur the surface infrastructure, the subsea pipelines, the surface facilities, all can be eventually linked. All right, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, David. Now, uh, moving on to the uh, next question. Um, so, and some of you have alluded to it already in your prior conversations, uh, but what are the different types of two digital twins that you've created in your companies? and, and um, if you and how uh, how have you deployed them? What I'm interested in is a specific example that you can share with the audience on the kinds of digital twins you you've built. So let me start with you, Ken, on this. So yeah, so within the company, obviously VP is a large company, so we have um, implemented various types of um, digital twin. You know, whether that's a dynamic simulator, whether it's a uh, 3D visualization uh, on the PDMS model, uh, whether it's just production data through some kind of Power BI tool. 
Um, so, you know, we have a smattering of various components of it throughout the company. Within the, the project, I'm uh, major that fire on the, the Mad Dog 2 project. Uh, like I said, we, we've been able to integrate all that together into a single tool um, to allow us to, to begin to, uh, to not have so many options um, that it, it, it sometimes confuses our, our team. So now they, they, they have a, a singular place that they can go to the access, whether that's uh, the visualization of a platform that's still being built or whether it's you know, looking at the reservoir or the seabed. Uh, with really adds built information in there. And that's the key, I think, uh, for us has been to make sure that the data uh, is accurate because as soon as data becomes inaccurate, then people lose confidence in uh, whatever system that you have and they begin to revert to you know other ways of, of getting that. And then then it kind of snowballs after that. So, so like I said, within BP, there's, you know, um, various types uh, on this project, like I said, we've been able to pull uh, a lot of that together into a single uh, solution. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, 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 thanks, Ken. And how about you, uh, Chris? Yeah, so uh, first off, I just want to reiterate, uh, you know, one thing that Ken mentioned, and that's the value of information and, and a good data foundation, because um, you know, that's, that's critical. So I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier as far as our, our most mature application to digital twin is in Norway with our Ecofis assets, uh, where we already have a strong data foundation in place. Uh, we have built a, uh, a visualization hub, uh, so a, a really good replica of the platforms out there. And we're, we're using those for work planning, as I mentioned earlier. So work planning, is essentially building work packs without having to uh, step on the platform. So, so having more of our workforce uh, at the shore base, building work packages based upon the information that's already there and issuing those work packs uh, for modification product projects. It's, it's a brownfield sort of application. Uh, and then the second, as I mentioned earlier too, is, is inspection, so building inspection plans uh, making that more efficient uh, inspection routes, uh, because if you go onto a, a complex platform, it can be very difficult even to find uh, your inspection point where you're looking for. So the digital twin helps us uh, make that that smoother. Uh, so on the greenfield side too, in, in Alaska, uh, with our Willow development, we're doing essentially kind of a grassroots uh, digital twin application. So. Uh, starting in the construction yards, obviously with, with the 3D models, being able to catch issues, fit-ups, um, any conflicts early on, which, which I, I think that's really, 3D models have been put to use in that way for, for many years, but then also to digitize the assets, so integrate uh, the digital twin as the way we, we run our business there. So, so it's digitizing all the data, building the visualization uh, hubs from day one, and then integrating that into uh, control and operations. Okay, thanks, uh, Chris. And how about you, David? Yeah, so I've recently, uh, um, this past, uh, yesterday changed companies, but the company I worked with before, we built uh, effectively a digital twin from the subsurface reservoir simulation through the surface facilities, which was an unmanned platform, uh, pipeline to shore to a gas plant where uh, products were, were separated and then dry lean methane was sent back offshore to re-inject. So uh, uh, a linked sort of process digital twin was put together for that to, uh, to better model the simulation. But the company hadn't gotten far enough yet to uh, in the process to uh, to start using the benefits of the other types of digital twins. Okay, so um, now, now uh, when when you deploy digital twins, there you probably start with certain outcomes in mind. So, what were some of the outcomes or key uh, KPIs that you were targeting by deploying digital twins? Uh, and you can draw on your. I know you just changed companies, but you can draw on your experience from prior companies on what well, kind the of outcomes you targeted, David. So. There's a really good uh, statistic. Well, it's, it's a sad statistic, but it's unfortunately the reality. In the North Sea, 
they've looked over all the projects and see how how's everybody performed in the first year of production. And plotting this up and statistically looking at it, the P50 result was companies were lucky to get up to 70% of their uh, nameplate capacity at the end of the year. And it sort of went up in a, a gentle slope from, say, 30 40% up to 70 to 80%. Why did they not do very good in the first year? Well, they, they had things about the real-world process outcomes that hadn't been properly simulated. Very commonly, control systems aren't properly designed. They're sort of done separately. Uh, thirdly, often there's operator training issues. If you haven't had a good digital twin that you can use for an operational training simulator, so different operators will have different kind of performance levels. And so when you look at that for the North Sea, um, getting up to 70 to 80 percent of your nameplate capacity at the end of the first year of production, that's a shockingly bad uh, result. And it means hundreds of millions of dollars of lost value. So this is a, a key sort of driver to companies to say, hey, we need to do better at this. We need to do better in our designs, uh, properly simulating the process and controls together for real world scenarios, test that with operational training simulators and then be ready once production starts to be updating your model. So that that's the hard lesson of industry that, that drives us to try to do better. That's a, that's a very telling example of an outcome that you were able to generate. Um, how about you, Ken? Um, Given the maturity levels with the, your deployment of twins, uh, what kinds of outcomes did you target and what kind of outcomes are you seeing now with your deployments? Yeah, so what, what we even, uh, our goal or aspiration from the very start is that we didn't want to deploy any solution without yielding some tangible business outcome, right? So we, everything that we've done, that we have done is to drive an ultimate um, business outcome. And, and, and of course, as uh, David mentioned, you know, one of the things is to drive operational efficiencies to, to, to see that we can operate the facility in a more efficient way to minimize kind of HSSE issue by minimizing uh, unnecessary trip offshore in our case, it's offshore or to any plants to minimize that, to, to ensure that we can drive real tangible business outcome. But what, what I would say is because we implement this very early on into our greenfield project, we, we've been able to drive value as we uh, as we built this because we use an iterative method to develop our dynamic digital twin. So even doing design and, and now doing um, uh, construction and commissioning process, we, we, we derive value even in doing this process. So I'll just give an example, when we're in design, very early on because we've incorporated not only kind of the two uh, the 3d visualization on the 2d screen you know and typical uh, digital twin but we've incorporated the use of immersive technology so in our case the use of mixed reality and the whole hands and kind of blend that together so that we allow our team to most visualize that on a two-dimensional screen but also an immersive three-dimensional space so what we've done is we've been able to detect a defect of design prior to going to construction. So we, for example, we were able to catch that one of our railing system used to offload one of our center generator was actually a foot shorter than, than specification called for during design. And we were able to catch that. Now, would we have caught that uh, during construction maybe? Um, but the, the intent is that we can catch that, minimize the rework necessary during construction, move it out. But now we're also going, you know, doing the construction and doing the um, the verification of the bill. We're able to go out there, inspect equipment, compare it to the, the specification real time, and compare things like time points, slope, angle, things that are necessary as part of our inspection process. So we tie that all together, and we're able to, again, consolidate the information in such a way that's easier for us to go backwards and forward uh, projected out. So along our journey, we've been able to derive value, tangible value of things that we really just didn't have to either rework or write new contracts for because we've been able to uh, get that directly from our dynamic digital twin. And like I said, we, we, we project um, that we'll be able to retain 
real tangible business outcome as well once we go into production. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so let me move on to um, a follow-up question on, uh, around this. So you've generated some outcomes, you went in with some outcomes in mind, you're able to generate those outcomes with digital twins, but how do you measure the value these digital twins bring to your operations? I mean, how, in keeping with the theme of the, the, uh, the panel discussion, um, how do you drive ROI fast? Is it fast or what, how do you do the ROI computation and how long does it take for you to realize the value of twins? And, and I'll start with you, Ken. Okay, sure. Um, so, you know, obviously ROI can be, um, you know, tricky sometimes, but the way that we've done it, of course, is, you know, there, there's hard ROI and, and, you know, where your tangible uh, dollar savings or, or costs, um, cost, cost saving, and then there's more softer one, that, which are cost avoidance, uh, option, uh, operational efficiency and things like that. So I'll just speak a little bit for kind of the, the hard savings that we've been able to capture. So like I said, some of the design aspects, some of our um, things that we've been able to capture uh, during our design build phase were the elimination of not having to write new contract. So for example, the ability to generate isometric piping drawing, you know, normally we would go, go to market and, and get that done and create it uh, separately, uh, perhaps in some cases from our PDS model, but in this case, because we've been able to integrate out all the general arrangement drawing into our, our digital twin from a static perspective, tying that uh, through our, our tag ID, we were able to generate that information from the solution that we have. So we no longer had to kind of go to market to get that done. Uh, like I said, other things um, very similar to that in the way that we've been able to um, to catch errors, uh, either in the manufacturing or instead of doing design, resulted in direct cost saving because we're not able to have to go back and rework. Now, of course, on the softer side, you know, uh, it's a little bit harder, of course, to measure, um, you know, efficiency. So what we've done there is really just capture a baseline on experience. You know, if a task would have taken so much hour in the past. If you had to go and let's say do isolation, you know, if you were had to isolate uh, for vulnerability uh, management purposes or other things like that, you know, maybe you were doing that in, in multiple tool, maybe you print out uh, drawings and, and, and line tracing that. But now through the use of machine learning, we're automatically able to detect and isolate a valve or a pump and identify all the all the isolation valves and all the drain valves that, that are closer it automatically. So our engineers and, and our operation team can do that, you know, in a matter of seconds uh, versus before it would have taken hours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken, with that. Um, and maybe moving on to uh, David, so uh, would you be able to elaborate some um, uh, the, how you compute the value and return on investment with twins? Yeah. yeah. The, the, fortunately, even for companies um, like the ones I've recently been with, where they're at the start of their journey, there's good industry examples of people who have been quite successful. We have examples of uh, of uh, FPSOs in West Africa, which were able to start up to full production profile um, in a matter of days, whereas the industry norm was was weeks and months, where because they had had proper digital twin process simulations, linking everything across with the control system uh, in the, in engineering and in the yard and everything before they got out there. Uh, the other bit of industry uh, value that has been established is often in the past, people keep subsurface in a silo separate from the subsea, separate from the surface people, and everybody's getting their own data and optimizing within their own boundary, but you have to look at systems holistically. So you have to look at from the subsurface through the subsea and the surface facilities. And when people have done this with a, um, a process digital twin, they're finding out that they can optimize the reservoir uh, uh, performance quicker um, you're not going through these long iterative processes of getting some recommendation from subsurface that may or may not work with the rest of the facilities. You're getting this information quicker and people are getting six 
to 8% more recovery from the reservoirs. That's getting up to a plateau quicker, staying on plateau longer, and having a reduced decline curve. So that's gigantic value, tremendous amount of increased value. That's part of what people are going for. All right. How about you, Chris? Um, would you be able to tell your story on uh, on the value of digital twins in your company? Yeah, I, I would say it mirrors a lot of uh, you know what what Ken had mentioned around the, the software side, the cost avoidance and just if efficiencies. So added efficiencies in our our manpower, and it's not necessarily about uh, reducing manpower, but it's allowing them to do. Uh, more or, or focus on other things. So being more efficient um, uh, in the way we do our work. So less deployments to site, for example, is tangible hours uh, saved, especially you know uh, in growing assets where you have a growing asset base and the expectation is you know to, to maintain operating costs, you need to do more with less. So we see digital twins allowing us to do that. And then really more, more tangible type direct benefits uh, within the process simulation, uh, being able to measure uh, really on a daily basis our, our profitability, our, our delta between a digital twin application process simulation and more status quo and being able to, to physically measure uh, that difference in our profitability. So we do see some, some real-time gains uh, there on the process side. And really, it comes down to uh, you know four digital twins. It's it's as as Ken mentioned. It's it's about identifying the use cases. So what do you, what do you intend to do with it? And then outlining the the, the value drivers in those business cases right up front, uh, along with the talk about technology because you know digital twins. It it looks great. It's what we call the the shiny object. So if you see the simulation. You see a replica, it looks great, but what can it do? What value can it bring? And, and so for every application of digital twin that we have, we really scrub the, the use cases and really demand, you know, a, a good, concise uh, use case or use cases and, and developing a supporting business case. Thanks, Chris. Um, those were great examples and uh, compelling story on ROI with digital twins. Now, I see a lot of good questions coming in, um, so I'm wondering if I have a, if I should get a question in or go to the audience and get their questions. Um, uh, maybe I, I'll sneak one question in before I go to the audience. Um, now, there are some, you're, you're realizing some outcomes with digital trends, and typically these digital twins are running constantly either in the cloud or on the edge, depending on where you're deploying them. And these twins provide some insights. What challenges do you face in propagating those insights to the operational end of your organization? I, I presume the insights are generated somewhere in your IT department or, or your service or maintenance organizations, but how do you uh, propagate the insights that you glean from digital twins to the actual organization or to the, um, what I'll say, to the edge where the actions have actually got to be implemented? And maybe if I can start with you on that, Ken, if you can highlight how, what are, what are some of the challenges you face in propagating these insights? Yeah, so I think that, that's a really good question because there are challenges in that, right? With any large uh, or any size company that 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 has various kind of groups involved, uh, it's about how to present data, uh, you know, just in time and, and just the right amount of data because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, that's some of the challenges. And so, so the catch is how do you integrate all that in data together? So sometimes that can be a huge, big data issue, right? It, it just becomes overwhelming and you then begin to um, architect something that, that's kind of hard to realize. So, so what we've done uh, just to, to bring back is, is that we, we, tend, we, we leave those for us on the Mad Dog, we leave those data in place and we aggregate those data in real time um, through various uh, types of integration, uh, you know, internally we, we have um, 
a, a solution that's kind of looking to integrate some of these data together, right? Whether it's through the, our internal data lakes or the other methods. And we begin to draw that information from a central place. Uh, but where, where those things aren't available, we, we do um, aggregate that real time because what we, we don't want to do is replicate the data because there can only be one source of truth. And, and we, we would like, in, in, our, in, in my philosophy of that, is that it re should remain in those other system, the system of record, before it goes into the system of insight. So we, we, we leave those in those system of record and then we aggregate real time like I said, through these intermediate, intermediate um, tools, whether it's Day Lake or, or other tools that we have internal, and then we present that in a way that uh, that is meaningful, especially to that particular user and role. Because otherwise, I think what we end up seeing is that it becomes so much information that it's harder. It's hard for that person to then decipher and and and, and make decision or take action quickly. Um, so that's what we've done is that philosophy uh, we've carried through for what we've, uh, we've built uh, on, on the project. Thank you, Ken. I think at this point, I'd like to pivot to some of the audience questions. And uh, I, so let me uh, take the first question. So um, uh, the first question is, have your targets become more aggressive now with today's economic challenge? i.e. more focus on cost takeout. Uh, maybe start with you, Ken, on this. I'm sorry, I was on mute, sorry, yeah. I was on mute. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, so you're trying to get off, yeah. like, I didn't hear. Sure, um, have your targets become more aggressive uh -huh. now with today's economic challenges? Um, that is, meaning, is there more focus on cost takeout nowadays? Well, I, I would say generally, of course, that that given where we're at today with COVID-19, given where we're at with the, the, the cost challenge, and, and frankly, just pressure from everywhere, right? So so, so we, we see that it's a very difficult business environment, and, and that has, of course, um, intensified the need to to deliver um, a solution that will help bring that down. On the other hand, I think it's very important uh, for us to also deliver a solution that works, that ensures that we can safely operate uh, and, and build the system. So it is a balance, right, in, in, in regards to do we go so fast that we kind of uh, not take into these things account. Uh, so what I would say for us is that, yes, we do see that and it has, of course, intensify um, the, the desire to get uh, something out um, quicker. But we, we also balance that with ensuring that we're doing the right solution. And for us, what, what that has helped us work well is because we're using an agile uh, um, framework where we're able to deliver these things iteratively, right? Where we deliver these, what we call MVP, minimal viable product. In, in a short amount of time that then we can ensure that we're still meeting our aspiration, our goals uh, long term. So that's how we've been able, like I said, derive benefit as we, we've got, gone along. And, and these challenges, though some of them are newer, like COVID-19, some of the other ones, it's always been there, at least for us, in terms of uh, what we have been seeing, you know, some, some of these underlying um, business challenges. So I would say, uh, yes, but you know we also are, are, are looking to balance, make sure we're still delivering the right solution. Thanks, Ken. How, how about you, uh, David? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, we've been talking today a lot about uh, what people are doing at the front end, but there is also existing facilities in the world that that need to be made more efficient. So. Digital twins can be applied to to, to brownfield to existing uh, 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 facilities. So, uh, with the cost pressures we have, these facilities have to be more economic. We have to get more out of our existing wells. We have to try to be just as safe as we want to be, but maybe with fewer people. We want uh, maintenance to be more effective. So, you know, can we help uh, maintenance teams with things like uh, augmented reality? 
to to do the maintenance uh, correctly right the first time with help from remote experts. So there's a lot of things you can do with existing facilities to uh, with digital ten, twin tools to save money. But picking up on the point that both Chris and Ken mentioned about data, data is one of the biggest things about digital twins. In the past, uh, in the olden the olden days, people would uh, a design would do a bunch of work and then throw it over the wall to operations people right at around the time of startup, and there wasn't time for operations to effectively digest it. it hadn't had time to properly get trained on it, and then uh, in real time, the real time models weren't necessarily matched up with the design models. So that idea of a single version of the truth that you start real early and keep it live, that saves tremendous. It saves design time, procurement time, construction time, pre-commissioning time, operations time. So the, the data thread through all this, you know, we talked a lot about the simulations, but the data thread alone is tremendous value. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Let me move on to the next question, and I'll start with you, Chris. Um, so what's been the biggest challenge in deploying technology, this technology across different types of assets? You know, I, I would say that the biggest challenge, especially in the in the brownfield, is more of a more of a cultural challenge. You know, sure there are, there are technical aspects to applying it, but it's really, uh, especially in the brownfields, it, it is really about changing the way we work. And it's our work culture. So it is a, you know, developing a dependence upon the twin. So a good source of truth, a good source of data that's trustworthy, that people know they can depend on and they will come to it. And so that's absolutely critical um, in, in deploying. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's that, that data foundation and having a, that good data foundation that goes along with that. Uh, how about you, Ken? What do, what do you think uh, has been the biggest challenge in deploying um, twins across different asset types? I, I think um, to echo Chris Warner, of course, that that uh, you know I share the same um, thoughts there. But I, I think um, in addition to that, I think one one things that we've seen, uh, I think maybe David mentioned earlier, is the common understanding of what a digital twin is. Right? Uh, you know. People have different definition of it, so it's trying to get to the same vernacular, the same definition. Sometimes it's been challenging, and then of course the same goals, right? So, so I think, you know, early on, even within the the Mandoc two project, you know, to get our operation team, our quality team, our engineering team, to agree to a framework or, or a foundational to build that was important. And then much like, you know, we, we see that uh, across the board, that, that has been just to get people speaking the same language allows us to, 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 to deliver a common solution. But, but as, as Chris mentioned, you know, it, it's challenging to get that uh, homogeneous solution across every single asset because Brownfield, there's, there's different challenges. Onshore refinery, there's different challenges. So, so those, so those are some things we're still working out. Uh, but I think the first step that we we've seen, and or we're trying to do this more across kind of BP, is is get everybody to agree the same set of um, high level at least requirements, uh, and, and and defining what that means and what that that means to everybody. And so I think we've made good progress on that. Uh, we still have a ways to go. Um, but I think because we've been able to demonstrate um, tangible results on the Mandoc 2 project, on the Mandoc Phase 2 project, I, I think uh, we've been able to uh, more evangelize that within the company. Okay. Um, so th there's another question, and this is for you specifically, Ken. Um, how did BP go about determining what data was most important for the digital trend? Are there key parts of the data infrastructure that was key for implementation and enabling scalability? So with regards to what data was uh, was required, so like I said, initially what we did, uh, what I did was, you know, we defined a vision and that was in, in working with, with the various team that I work with, right? The, the head of our operation team, the head of our engineering team, the head of our, even our project management and overall project um, team to kind of define what data 
is ultimately necessary and at what level, right? So doing design, you know, these are the type of data that we need. So we, we got that together and we, uh, we identify those data sources. Like I said, BP, I'm sure like, like uh, ConocoPhillip and, and other co companies have a tremendous amount of data out there. So we, we got that down, we narrowed that down, and, and then we went after it. So how do we get all this data in? There is an initiative within BP that, uh, that is working to consolidate uh, all of this information, not, not from a data perspective, from an, you know, a tech term for a moment, a, a, a way that we can access data through an API through a common API. So, so we, that, that is not all the way done, but at least that's moving in the right direction. So what we've been, like I mentioned before, leverage that in, in areas where they haven't gotten to, we, we have had to incorporate that in. Um, so the way that we scale that is one, to incorporate our existing infrastructure. So things like moving our data into the cloud, and in our case, uh, the Microsoft Azure cloud, uh, and then leveraging some of those technology that's native to that to to enable us to to scale that up. So hopefully that answered that question. Yeah, I think so. And unfortunately, that's the uh, end of this discussion. We are out of time, um, and there are plenty of other questions, wonderful questions, but unfortunately, we haven't been able to get to them. Uh, but thank you very much for your time. I'll turn it over to Nicole now. Um, Nicole, over to you. Thank you very much, Sadir. And also thank you to Ken, David, and Chris that, for that interesting and informative webinar. For those watching, if you want to listen again, this webinar will be available on demand shortly. Finally, thank you to you, wherever you are, for taking the time to listen in and remember to check out more of our upcoming and on-demand webinars at oilandgasiq.com. Enjoy the rest of your day.